All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Ray Reich, who is up in San Francisco today. Equally sunny, I hope, Ray. I am. It's beautiful. It's 75 degrees, which is beautiful in San Francisco. It is, it is. San Francisco, who we're, we were just talking before coming on air, I lived there for a while, and I can tell you the microclimates up in the city are real. You could be on, I remember I lived on Diamond and 28th, you could be on 28th and it would be sunny and you turn around the corner and go up Diamond and it's freezing. <laughs> Same thing here. I'm two blocks away, it could be a totally different climate. I know, it's amazing. Thanks for having me here, John. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming. And Ray has over 30 years experience in subscription software leadership and has led go-to-market teams across marketing, sales, customer success, and professional services at multiple SaaS companies. And he's the author of Data and Diagnosis Driven Selling at Techro Media, published in November of 2023. The hard, or you said this is softback or the hardback just came that out? That was the soft copy and our hardback came out in early February. Yeah, and is doing and is doing great. So we're going to talk about that, the science of selling using a systematic data-driven sales process. So um, Ray, let's just start off, right? Data data driven. There's there's a couple of things here that give salespeople and sales leaders heart attacks or heartache immediately. Is number one is process, and the second is data driven because a lot of times you know traditionally in sales people like to think well it's a combination of a little bit of magic and a little bit of instinct, a little bit of art, and yeah, well a little bit of data. Um, but the idea of process has has kind of been a bit of a dirty word to many in sales because they feel like it constrains them. But we know the truth is the process done properly is not a constraint. It's actually uh, it's actually a massive benefit. And then when you mix data driven decision making into it, so tell me how you came to this book with your co author. Yeah. So so we have there's four authors on the book. So Bob Scarperi runs a company called Revenue Vision Partners. Mark Petruzzi, who has multiple successful runs at companies like Accenture, Oracle. And then Paul Macchiori, who was the original chief revenue officer at Ariba, mm -hmm. that company, and then at Anaplan. And I am I have had five exits in revenue, recurring revenue businesses over the last 25 years. And we all come at it from a different perspective, but fundamentally, this is not a new sales methodology. It's the combination of a structured stage-by-stage -stage sales process that is informed by data. And we can start, start from the very beginning of the sales process, who you're reaching out to, to who you should continue to pursue. Yeah. And what I like what you just said there, Ray, because I think it's a very, very important distinction, and it's one that people often miss, is they, they conflate sales methodology and sales process we were talking before coming on air i used to run a co i used to run the company hothwaite mm -hmm. which was spin selling spin selling is a sales methodology it is not a sales process a sales process is, is what you define you know based on your buyer journey or or whatever whatever but i think that's such an important distinction and i guess you've seen that conflated on many occasions i presume many times like are you trying to become the next spin selling or the yeah. challenger sell or yeah. Sandler selling. But it all starts with where do you invest your precious time as a sales professional to get the highest returns? And in today's world, there's so much data about who to call upon, who to reach out to. Why wouldn't you use that? And it starts with ensuring that you're allocating your time to the highest priority yeah. and highest potential ideal customer profile. Right. And and part of that, Ray, is uh, what I always came across was this, that a lot of sales leaders and sales managers tend to focus at the end of the sales process, right? You know, they try to kind of parachute at the end and help kind of push things over the line. Whereas what you're talking about right here is investing your time in the highest and best qualified leads, the ideal target customer and all that, which means that their time should be spent a lot more at the early stages of the sales process, helping with qualification, which may lead to a smaller pipeline, uh, but a more effective and one that's more likely to you know, deliver results. In fact, when I ran revenue organizations, I said, your goal is to get to know as soon as possible. Right. 
and no is you've decided not to pursue or the potential customer knows that you're not the right fit. So let's start with kind of the ideal customer profile. Now, yeah, for years we could buy sales intelligence data, yep. which was buyer, you know, company, maybe some firmographic, what size, what industry, what location. And then we started to get more technographic information. Oh, they have this tech stack, which is a good combination with ours. But now with intent data, and we're talking first party intent data from your own website, second and third party intent data, you can decide who to reach out to at the right time. Because as we all know, four to 6% max of any potential buyer is in the market for your type of product at, at a point in time. Why not prioritize our outreach to those people that there are some signals of who we should reach out to? Yeah. So, so how does, so how do you implement something like that? Because I think there's a part of, uh, you know, today where people get very confused, as you said, you know, you can get demographic, firmographic, technographic intent data. Uh, how do you, how do you know where to start and where to pull this together and where you should focus? Cause sometimes the other, the flip side of it is sometimes I see people get so focused on the data and the amount of analytics and, and uh, that they can do that they never move past that. Well, what's interesting is the best place to start is where you've ended up successfully multiple times before. What mm. do I mean by that? The best way to initially profile who your ideal customer profile is, is your most successful customers. And that does not mean the customers that you've closed in the last two, four, eight quarters. It's the customers that you've closed, that you've retained and renewed, and you've expanded the relationships with. Sometimes those customers who represent the highest net revenue retention are indicative of who you should go after in the future. So that's the first thing. And the mm -hmm. second thing is being able to purchase intent data from the six senses and demand bases of the world. It's not that difficult to integrate that into your CRM data. And they will even do historic analysis that says, oh, for all the customers that you've closed over the last two, four, eight quarters. Let's see what the intent data suggested. And often you will find that 70, 80% of the customers that actually purchased, there were positive intent signals before they bought from you, which is a good predictor of having appropriate intent data for future buyers. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And that that's that that for me is is very, very uh I mean that's very easy to get your head around. Uh, and and nowadays it's very easy for you to do. I just want to come back to that interesting point you just made about your ideal uh your ideal target customer. I think sometimes we, I, I agree with what you said, but I think sometimes we ignore the successes we've had because we somehow convince ourselves that there is a there is a bigger better profile of customer that we should go after and that can actually derail you yeah and that's why i use retention data as a primary signal because it's that customer that has the highest customer lifetime value over two or three years that's who you want to get more of and in fact what we often do is we get one big new customer in the financial services industry we just closed bank of america let's go after the other top 20 money right. center banks right but we don't even know if there's good product market fit with that customer yet. And we definitely don't know if they're going to see value and stick around for two or three years. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you, how do you, or how can salespeople develop like the skills to be able to, you know, co-create with customers and capture the future if you like, because uh, I mean, cause that's what people are looking for. They're looking for partners in, in a salesperson. They're looking for somebody who gets them, who sees, hears and understands them and can add some value to that conversation. Well, in the book, after you identify the, the highest potential ideal customer profile and you start doing the outreach, the first thing you want to do is a business diagnosis. And that business diagnosis, I mean, often we use the word discovery call, right? Mm -hmm. What we're trying to under understand is the value and how we deliver value is aligned to what that business needs currently. Let's say you're a CRM vendor, right? Or we're having a hard time getting a 360 view of our customer mm -hmm. across marketing, sales, customer success, right? So is that a pain point? Yes, that's a major pain point. We have three different data repositories hard to get to. Now, is that pain point 
Yeah, is that something that if you solved it, how would you measure the benefit? Mm -hmm. Would it be higher close rates? So you're doing some business diagnosis, right? To see if there's an alignment of the business pain and the business value to move on. And once you have that, then you get into a more detailed, deeper functional diagnosis. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how your sales organization is engaging with top of the funnel information from marketing. Where do they use it? How do they use it? How does it get updated? How do you make sure it's cleansed? So you're doing almost a customer process functional diagnosis to say, ah, oh, those are five symptoms that the majority of our successful customers also experienced. So I think there's value to pursuing this going forward. So let me stop there before I just yeah. keep talking. <laughs> no, no, that was excellent. And there's a couple of things you you mentioned there is um, the one thing is diagnosis. Uh, we used to say, what's it? Uh, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Uh, but we see that all over the place. <laughs> We're, but the other thing there you mentioned too, which is interesting, is that when when a, a prospect or a buyer raises a pain point, if you're or a perceived pain point or an issue or something, uh, it, it is a mistake that often some salespeople make is to jump on that and say, fantastic, they just said something, I can solve it, and they jump on it. And the fact is that may not be an issue that either they see a great return on solving or they don't have the, you know, they, they don't have a great motivation to solve it. It's just something that they mentioned. And if you went and did the, di the diagnosis and kept the conversation and drilled down a little bit, you might discover that there are more pressing business issues that they want to solve. But if you jumped on the first one, you may actually eliminate yourself from the equation entirely. You know, you're exactly right. So, you know, in the, the expertise that you build on doing this again and again, think of that repetitive muscle, you'll get better and better at doing that business and functional diagnosis. But even then, the next stage that we talk about in the process is the solution design. Mm -hmm. So based upon everything we've heard, here's what we're recommending to you. We're not doing a demo yet. This is just what you would use from us. And here's how it would be used. Does that sound about right? Do you see your users doing this? Oh, no, they would prefer to do this first versus that. And all that can be input into the solution demonstration. So you design a high-level solution. You basically test that with the buyers. Mm -hmm. And then you get into the detailed demonstration. And in that solution demonstration, you're still trying to tease out almost why this wouldn't be successful at that prospect. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't have the resources to implement it. Maybe it's the integration to these two legacy systems that would be very problematic. So you're almost looking yourself for reasons that they wouldn't buy versus trying to convince them of why they would buy. That's that's a little reverse engineering. Yeah, no, it's excellent. And it's also, it is allowing you the opportunity to partner with them, you know, and to become a, you know, that, you know, we, we always talk about the, you know, the trusted advisor. Uh, but if you were just if you were just saying, oh great, let me do a demo for you. Yeah, yeah, I heard what you said. Let me just show you how we can do all of this. I, that's as I said, that's so superficial that people realize that you may you may be completely off track. What you're talking about is really validating and then making sure that you are validating as you go and co-creating, as you said, uh, as you go. Uh, so mm -hmm. tell me this. Uh, uh, Tell me this. So there is another little wrinkle that's come into all of this now, and that's AI, right? So tell me a little bit about how you think AI is going to impact all of this uh, today and going forward, because we've never seen such a rapid adoption of technology before in as AI. And I was telling somebody the other day, I've never seen where I have started using an AI tool for three weeks and then switched to another one because it's better three weeks later, <laughs> a new one's come out. So how how can people leverage AI um, in the context of what you're talking about here without getting distracted into shiny new toys? Yeah, well, there's so many ways I could respond to this, but as part of our book, what we talked about was, yeah, you have all these process steps that are well-defined, but you also want to look for unknown things that mm -hmm. indicate whether a deal is going to progress forward or not. So I think deal inspection or opportunity inspection is one of the best leverage points for AI today. And that's where you can use a tool that looks at a specific opportunity, looks at the pace and cadence of conversations, 
can analyze the semantic reference in the recorded calls, can look at calendars and how much there's time between meeting one, meeting two, meeting three, and compare it to a thousand other deals that have been closed in your organization. So really to leverage the AI to say, the probability of this deal closing is 30% and closing the next two months is probably 10% because of these factors. So using AI to surface the risk in a deal. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting a really interesting way of looking at it because uh, a lot of people today it's all about the upfront. It's like, oh, AI can like do the outreach for me. It can do this for me, do that for me. But what you're talking about more is here is the analysis of the data, helping you with the analysis of the data to actually uncover uncover patterns and real indicators. Yeah, you might say, okay, for this size of deal, it's an enterprise customer, it's a hundred thousand. We typically find it's nine different um, people were actually involved in the buying process. They now do an automated query on this opportunity and you're talking to two people. One is the director and the other one is a vice president of programs or budgeting. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, in every other deal, we've seen that it's when the SVP of the function and or finance gets involved for the first time, that that's a signal of a higher propensity to close over the next three months. And it's hard to do all that just manually. It's not a gate. It's not a, I click this button that I delivered that piece of content. I know the budget. I know the need is validated and the time frame is in 90 days. That doesn't tell you anything about the propensity of a deal to close. Yeah. And, then, and what's fascinating about what you just said there is, I mean, you're right, you know, nine people in a deal. I mean, I think the, I, I can't remember what the latest stats are for how many people are involved in, in B2B complex sales, but it's a whole heap of people. <laughs> but as you said, you could easily get distracted into trying to figure out each person and what, you know, and all of that. And, and, and maybe you're going to end up investing time with people who, yeah, they're, they're, adjacent to it but they're not critical to the decision making process and what you're talking about there is really honing in on the people who are critical to the decision making process correct and the other thing is if you have a well-defined stage by stage process over time you're going to know what the sweet spot is to move from stage three to stage four whether that's you know <clears throat> um, demo to vendor of choice mm -hmm. and ai can say well, the average deal that closes, it spends 22 days in that stage. This one's at 38 days or 49 days. This is more indicative of a less than 10% chance of closing. So um, duration and time has a direct correlation to win rates. Yeah. But it's going to close next month, Ray, because I, although I did tell you that last month, but I promise <laughs> you next month. <laughs> hey, uh, we just conducted some research, John. The average number of times that an enterprise class um, deal close date changes, that that is closed, five, five point two x to be exact. So right. we know that's not true. <laughs> that's funny. That's a, that's a good stat. Um, so just in in closing, what what do you think are are if somebody was to start to dip their toe in the water and wanted to get more data driven uh, with their sales process, what, what's a good place to start? I think a really good place to start is read data and diagnosis driven selling. Mm -hmm. And the reason I said that it's not just a blatant pitch for the book. What we did was we talked to about 15 cloud Titans and to tell us stories about how they used a structured process and data to success. People like Mark Reberge, the mm -hmm. founding CR at HubSpot. Yeah. John Miller, the founder of Marketo and then Engageo. Jim Steele, the president of Salesforce, Andy Byrne, the founder and CEO of, of Clary. So what we tried to do was instead of just having the academic approach to use this process and you'll be better, it's here's how real life practitioners who have been extremely successful have leveraged the concept from the book, John. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. And uh, having I, I have uh, met Mark Roberge a couple of times, a very smart, very smart individual. But yeah, I mean, great, great, uh, great insights from from great people. And thank you for pulling all of that together in a in a book for people to be able to leverage. So um, all of Ray's information will be below this video, Ray. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. 
Okay, so after almost 30 years in recurring revenue software businesses, um, I thought there was a big gap in the marketplace, and that is benchmarks that are relevant, timely, and contextualized. So that I, as a sales leader or a customer success leader, say, well, what should my win rate be? What should my customer acquisition cost be for a product my size? So over the last three years, we built the industry's largest benchmarking database. That's in, um, gathering data from 18,000 B2B SaaS companies and over half a million data points. So you can follow us at benchmarket.ai. And we also hold the industry's most popular and only event dedicated to best practices of using metrics to inform decisions in the SaaS business model called SaaS Metrics Palooza. Or you can listen to SaaS Talk with the Metrics Brothers, another way that we just are trying to provide information based upon the collective wisdom of the industry. The Metrics Brothers, I love it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, as I said, always information will be below this video, and I, I, I really encourage you to check it out and check out the book uh, because, uh, I mean, this is the future. I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, you say it's the future, it's the present and the future is getting much more data driven, getting much because we don't have time and people don't have time for wasting on, on the old, uh, what I used to call the feel good funnel where you just load a load of stuff into the funnel and it makes you feel good, but it doesn't actually result in anything at the other end. Um, so listen, thanks again, Ray. Thank you for watching and listening and I will see you all again soon. Thank you. John, thank you. Yeah.